Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, I have known you one or two years, I think, and uh, I won't try and count them. Uh, but actually reflecting on some of what Megan said earlier, um, some similarities at the start of my career were being sort of dropped in at the deep end and learning very, very fast. Uh, and sometimes I think we, we overprotect some of our youngsters uh, and, and don't give them that exposure that really is, you know, those that can will step up to the plate uh, and we need to do more of that. Uh, it's really good to be here and has been reflected earlier, there have been a few false dawns uh, with this conference and so I thought I would start with a picture of hopefully what is the sun rising. Uh, some of you may recognise it but that is actually looking eastwards, it is the sun rising so hopefully this is the start of uh, the sun rising on uh, a new dawn of electrification after the problems we had with CP5. So I, I just want to talk about what I think the electrification network may look like. Uh, looking into the future, I'm not that good, uh, as I don't suppose anyone else in this room is. So sure, lots of you will have different ideas of what it might look like, uh, and this is really just to start a debate. So where do we start? Uh, quite a lot of what I want to say has already been covered as far as Scotland is concerned, uh, with what's been talked about this morning by Bill uh, and Alan. But for those that aren't familiar with it, the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy is a really solid document that was published just at the beginning of uh, lockdown, undertaken by Network Rail, but on behalf of the industry, analysing in a lot of detail what an electrified network or what a decarbonised network should really look like uh, as we meet the challenges of decarbonisation and the, the legal framework that we're being uh, pushed into. It is ambitious, uh, the extent of electrification that's proposed, uh, and that's part of the challenge, uh, and we're probably already a little bit behind the curve of where we would like to be in order to achieve it. So we do need to see how we can accelerate and make sure that electrification uh, is on the agenda in a serious way. So in a bit more detail, some, a map from uh, the TDNS, but the proposal is to electrify 11,700 single track kilometres uh, of route, which everyone in this room, I'm sure, uh, doesn't need to be told it is a significant amount. But that's not the whole network. Um, Bill and, and Alan have talked a bit about the bits in Scotland that won't. So 400 single track kilometres of a battery operation proposed, um, and there are limitations in, in what batteries can do even with the proposed and anticipated development of battery technology. But typically at the moment, 60 to 80 kilometers uh, and no more than 100 mile an hour operation. Hydrogen, a lot of our politicians are very keen to see hydrogen as the savior to avoid all the infrastructure costs that we're here really to talk about. But again, they're limited uh, and I'll come on with a bit more detail later, but to about 100 miles an hour again, even though they've got a greater, longer range than, than the batteries. Uh, and proposals there is about 900 single track kilometer, and quite a lot of that is the likes of the uh, North Island line uh, and the far north line here in Scotland. And there's still another 2,300 single track kilometers of just the existing network uh, without any reopenings that might be proposed uh, or being developed. Uh, that, that at the moment it's still not clear and as we move towards 2050 should become clear as to what the uh, most appropriate technology will be to uh, decarbonise them. So, uh, got ahead of myself I think. Just to quote from TDNS, Battery and hydrogen technologies are unsuitable for long distance, high speed and freight services. We've heard about the importance of freight and the need uh, for um, modal shift onto the rail. And these services have higher energy needs than battery and hydrogen can provide. And just reference there to the Why Rail Electrification booklet that was published by RIA last year. And within that, it talks about the challenges we have with different technologies. And just to quote from that, the equivalent volume for the same energy content for hydrogen at 700 bar, so that's a very high pressure, is seven and a half times the equivalent diesel fuel tank volume. More realistically, at uh, 
three and a half, uh, three, 350 bar, that volume is up at over 12 times the equivalent of a diesel tank. If we're talking about batteries, we're talking about 21 times the volume with current battery technology. A lot of research is going into battery technology and how the capacities can be increased, but even on current forecast by 2035, that will still be over 13 times the volume of a diesel tank. So somehow you've got to fit that on your train before you start putting any passengers uh, on board as well. I won't dwell on this uh, map because you've already seen it before, so just highlighting uh, where we're looking to electrify in Scotland and, and some of the routes that, that won't be electrified. Uh, and, and batteries, as we've already been told, uh, will form an interim proposal. Within the TDNS, I'm not going to take you through the whole of the uh, rest of the network. You can go and look at that for yourselves. But just to give you an example of the extent of electrification that's being proposed, this is just in the East Midlands. Uh, the colour scheme, if you look at the original as well, is possibly a bit clearer. The black line running up the centre of that diagram is the East Coast Main Line, which is already electrified. But as can be seen, this, the green solid lines have proposed further electrification. Significantly, the Midland Main Line, which is already uh, in development, uh, then the GNGE uh, link line, uh, and a lot of routes around South and, North, uh, and West Yorkshire are shown on there. And a lot of that is freight as well as for passenger use. What this shows is that we need to be planning for the future. We can't stop and start and say, oh, we just want to electrify a bit of the Midland Main Line now, and then we'll do the rest maybe in a few years' time. Or we're thinking about doing the uh, GNGE, but uh, we won't bother looking at that until we're actually ready to, to, to start construction. That doesn't work. So we need to be planning now, and as uh, Alan has already mentioned, particularly starting to look at uh, grid connections that we all know from experience on previous electrification program the grid connections are a very long lead item. So we need to be starting to plan now, and I'm really pleased to say that in, in Scotland that plan is already very well progressed, uh, and thanks to Brian Sweeney for some of these diagrams. So at the moment, Alan's already talked about 18 new grid supply points, nine of them are shown here uh, in, in the north, and we need to be looking at how we work with the supply industry for those supply points. Eastern region, I know, are also developing their plans well, and they're talking about an additional 35 to 38 new grid connection points across the region. That includes uh, the Anglia routes as well, but a significant investment in new supply points, and a further 15 existing supply points that are likely to need upgrading. Furthermore, we talked a bit about battery electrification, and here in Scotland, looking very much at how to achieve that end target that will allow freight movements as we've shown earlier but with batteries as an intermediate battery EMUs whereby you electrify around the feeder stations so we haven't got to have long lengths of cable connecting non-electrified gaps in the system use that those sections to charge your batteries and to provide traction power and then when you get away from the electrified route you can operate in the battery mode and this will enable uh, us to use the new technology that wasn't available to us when we electrify the likes of the East Coast Main Line uh, because we didn't have those hybrid type trains available. So you had to have the whole network or the whole of a route completed before you could actually realise the benefits. We're in a very different position now where we've got to start realising those benefits as soon as we can. Discontinuous electrification is also pretty well developed uh, in Wales on the Core Valley lines. Uh, and some of the Amy people here today uh, are very much involved in that. A different approach there that this is uh, for a permanent solution uh, and, as I said before, isn't really appropriate for freight. But the reason and one of the main drivers for this are there's some pretty complex areas that would cost a lot of money, uh, particularly the likes of Carfilly Tunnel. Uh, so an uh, a discontinuous electrification solution uh, has been agreed. But there are some limitations, and some of the key issues that really need to be considered uh, the reliability of the system. You're raising and lowering pantographs. It'll only take that not to happen on one occasion where the pantograph runs off the end of the wire, fails to lower, gets wrapped around a bridge, and drivers are going to lose confidence in that system. So we've got to be developing very reliable systems, and that costs money, and it's more control systems that uh, have the potential to go wrong. Also, 
if you're matching the trains to the infrastructure, you want to get the batteries to the optimum size so they can cover the gaps that you've got in your infrastructure, but you don't want them twice the size or three times the size. So you actually have to develop the whole system looking very closely at the rolling stock and the infrastructure combined. That adds complications and also has the potential to result in a very bespoke solution where those trains are de designed just to fit that network and you don't then have the flexibility of cascading them onto other routes in this, with the same level of flexibility in the future. So I think I support uh, a lot of the views that have already been expressed that discontinuous electrification does have a place particularly as a route to complete and continuous electrification but there are some problems there. Some of the other advantages that we need to be looking at, though, in considering this interim state is the, is the uh, degraded modes. Do we need to provide all the facilities that we would for a completely electrified line, particularly in the N-1 scenario, or can we make some savings now that we can change the sectioning, uh, having a view to the future, but not install all the equipment now? Let's not <coughs> burden ourselves with additional costs now that are only there to really be provided for the future when you've got a fully electrified network. So if you do have an incident with the overhead line uh, and with the power supply, you can then make the use of your onboard power supply to get over that problem, rather than having to provide a lot of redundancy in the equipment that will cover your N minus one scenario. I suspect I'm overrunning already, so starting to look at some of the technology developments, having looked at the network that we want to achieve, one of the key things now is we need to plan now based on the technology available today. Uh, I think Scotland have got this. Uh, I'm not so sure about England and the political will there. We have a serious risk that we um, are thinking that there'll be some magic solution that will mean that we don't have to invest in the infrastructure. Once we get into the detail of the infrastructure as well, let's plan on what we know now, which is proven and is reliable. Only introduce new technology as and when it becomes available, when it's proven and at the appropriate time in the life cycle. Let's not try and bring all this innovation in when we're actually trying to construct something. We've made reference this morning to learning the lessons from CP5. We really must learn them. We've done the lessons learned, now let's actually learn the lessons and not try and design in parallel with innovation and in parallel with actually trying to construct. Let's move away from that. That means we've got to be looking more to the future, planning now, starting the design now for projects that are unlikely to be introduced and actually constructed for five years down the road. We've got to have that funnel of projects and routes to be electrified uh, and I try and avoid using the word projects because I think it needs to be that rolling programme. But the future parts of that programme we need to be planning for now. Digital twins will be a, a key part. Uh, another, this is actually not a photograph. This is uh, modelling of just south of Glasgow Central at Selkirk where we did some work modelling there, some problems where uh, pantographs were clashing with the infrastructure, and by creating a digital twin, we were able to uh, identify the solution and prove it before it was actually built. Uh, boosting uh, power supplies, as we use more and more electric, we'll need to reinforce the power supplies. New technology, I think, will be introduced there. Use of smart grid is going to be key. Uh, static frequency converters, line-side generation are all facilitated uh, if we are smart grid ready. Uh, no, further um, picture, again, one of those is real, one of those is a digital twin. Uh, I've always struggled to remember which is which, but actually the one on the left is a more recent photograph. The one on the right was at Rob Royston uh, before it, in, in the design stage, before the equipment and the station was built. Uh, rationalised distribution. Alan was talking about footprints. We can look at this and the, the sequence of diagrams on the right shows how potentially we can move to a position where a single circuit breaker can control the whole of a section uh, of a feeding section. So if you get a fault on the section, you open the circuit breaker, the whole lot gets um, isolated, you can then open remotely the switches around the fault reclose the circuit breaker and you can carry on operation. And all that can happen within milliseconds. So the disruption to the service is, is very short. So we need to be looking at that significant cost savings uh, in terms of uh, distribution equipment. 
Overhead line developments, basically, the overhead line equipment in 30 years' time is probably not going to look that dissimilar to what it is now. We will be using new materials. Voltage control clearances are now a common feature. Uh, there will be additional safety measures, I'm sure, identifying where you are on the network, what is live, use of handheld devices to say you can't go near that equipment or, yes, that piece of equipment you're working on uh, has been earthed and is safe to work on. That type of technology, rather than the actual wires, we still need copper wire suspended above the forefoot to enable electric trains to run. I don't believe that will change. Pantograph technology, however, could well develop further, is likely to develop further, dynamic pantographs, and we've got to make sure that the overhead line and that pantograph interface are key and are managed properly. So, in summary, what will we be uh, in, in 2050 looking ahead? Most of the network will be electrified, I believe, and should be, and needs to be, following on the messages from this morning, because of the decarbonisation challenge, the legal requirements that the country has set itself, but it won't be if we can't significantly reduce the cost, uh, and that was very well clarified this morning. In order to do that, production line of projects starting typically five years ahead of installation and not, we're going to suddenly start a project, let's get on and do the design, oh, we've got a contractor on board who's um, chomping at the bit to get started, got resources available, let's start building it and we'll make all the rectification works afterwards. We've got to look at that. Embod embodied carbon is going to be a key element. So how we improve the selection of materials is going to be key. Uh, we will have much more automation, and that will go through the design phase uh, from start to the end of the life cycle and the operational phase, but also automate the procurement processes. Uh, and choice of equipment, again, will be determined significantly by uh, the carbon content, and carbon will be a much more significant driving factor than we've considered in the past. Standards, we need to be looking at standards and challenging ourselves with standards. Uh, asking why we do everything and, and anything. Why, and coming back to Megan's earlier point, uh, when you start off, you do things because that's the way it's been done and that's the way you've been taught. But as engineers, we should be challenging that all the time. Are we really needing to do that? Is there a better way of doing that? And in order to be able to make those changes, we need to understand why we're doing something rather than what we're doing and because that's the way we've always done it. And we're already discovering and work through some of the work that we're doing as part of the cost-efficient electrification program that the simple rule of one in five times line speed for the gradient of a contact wire with modern pantograph technology is no longer relevant. But just to change that, say, oh, we're going to change the grading, wouldn't work unless we understood why and how we can go about doing that. So particularly for the younger engineers amongst you, but also for us that are starting to get a few more grey hairs, we've got to continue to ask ourselves and challenge, do we know why we're doing things, not just what we're doing? Lastly, just to close, safety must remain a priority. And we must not compromise on safety just to achieve some short-term cost savings. Uh, so I think there's all sorts of opportunities for safer isolations, uh, and using technology, but let's not cut safety out of the processes uh, just for some short-term gains. And we've seen some of the challenges that have come out just recently with the Carmont report, uh, and the, any accident costs a significant amount of money. So we need to be avoiding those accidents in the first place uh, and take safety as, as a critical way forward and keep it in the forefront of what we're, we're, we're designing. Thank you for listening. I hope that gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what the future might look like, uh, but one thing I can guarantee is it won't actually look like that at all. Thank you.